Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for coming on such a beautiful night. We appreciate it. Uh, my name is John Yap with the Department of Neighborhood and Development Services. Uh, here to introduce the team from Opticos Design, which has been hired to assess the North Side neighborhood and the South District uh, for missing middle housing. Uh, speaking tonight will be John Meeky, uh, Dan Parolik, and Courtney Sawyer from Opticos Design, and also Rick Chelman from TND uh, Engineering. And with that, I'll turn it over to John. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, please let me know if I'm not being projecting enough. Um, so thank you for coming tonight. Uh, this is our second trip of three trips. Uh, last trip we were here, um, we got to have, spend some time with you all and talk about the South District. We got to tour. Tonight we're going to just talk about what we heard last trip. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, street design and connectivity and how to do, uh, create more walkable streets. We're gonna talk a little bit about missing middle housing. And then really the primary focus tonight is to jump into an exercise where we're gonna ask you all to help us think about different ways that housing could be integrated in the South District. So we'll do that as an interactive exercise. Um, like I said earlier, uh, we were here uh, in February. Uh, the South District meeting was on the 15th. And uh, Rick Shellman came in March uh, to kind of get a sense of Iowa City and meet with staff. So that was really just us starting to understand the issues that were going on in Iowa City. Uh, this next phase is us just exploring ideas, trying to understand things with, with you all as a community and with staff. We're in the first trip of two trips uh, during this phase. So we'll be coming back, and we haven't set the date yet, but we'll come back and we'll talk to you again about what we heard, new things that we're thinking about, uh, and get feedback on that. And then, uh, then we'll be compiling everything we've done into a report. It just says about some ideas and things that the city could continue to look into um, in the future. So uh, we got a chance to drive around and photograph some of the South District. So we saw the wonderful trail system you have, the housing that you have, uh, and some of the small parks and the lending libraries. Um, and we recognize that the South District, there's been a lot of time and effort spent in planning the South District. A lot of things have already been implemented. So whether it's the greenways, the trails, uh, Cherry True Blood Park, the soccer fields near the uh, water treatment plant. Um, and we recognize that everything in white here is pretty much kind of where the South District was saying in the future growth can happen, right? And talked about streets. And so you've got the wonderful school that we're in today and you've got, uh, you know, the ag fields currently being used. And in the South District, you all talked about there's going to be this interconnected network of streets, different kinds of intensity of housing. You already have the school. And there might be some kind of main street that happens here at uh, McAllister when it intersects with Sycamore in the future. So what did we hear from the community? That connectivity, right? Right now, um, you know, everyone is dreaming about the future when we have more connectivity. When McAllister goes through, it'll reduce some of the through traffic happening on some of the streets that you have today. Um, there was this really a lot of discussion about, you know, if you live in the South District, there is retail nearby, but you often have to cross Highway 6, right? And so that is a little bit of an impediment. And so again, the South District plan called for, can we get some retail down here that's neighborhood serving? And that was repeated in the, both the stakeholder meetings and the uh, work, um, workshop we had accessible and diverse set of options of housing. So just a desire to see a mix of different kinds of housing at different price ranges. And, and um, I think this was the other one we heard was opportunities for aging in place. Just the idea that um, houses could be designed more accessibly. There are more options for maybe um, uh, family members to be able to have uh, 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 someone who's older live in an ADU behind or share on a lot if possible. Heard a lot of other things. Uh, this presentation will post as a PDF so you can read these. We'll also be summarizing all of this in a report. Um, in the workshop that we had, uh, we had a lot of people come out and we um, spent some time marking up maps, thinking about ideas where people wanted to see housing, where people might want to see parks. Um, and again, a lot of those same themes came up uh, about connectivity, about uh, better and more parks building on that. One of the ones that, that was really highlighted, though, was that currently today, the bus doesn't serve the district as well. And um, so we, just as an update, we were able to talk later with, um, uh, with the 
bus provider, I'm forgetting the name right now. Uh, and they said that in the future, they do anticipate when McAllister connects through that they can re-change their routes to better serve uh, the South District. Uh, and again, common themes of housing options, connectivity, uh, and that last one was when that connectivity happens, really relieving the neighborhood streets as being those connectors. Um, so with that, I'll ask Rick Chelman to talk a little bit about uh, connectivity and street design. Thank you, John. So this is in the report. I certainly will not read anything to you, much less this entire text uh, slide. But the South District plan that you all, I'm sure, are very familiar with is, is very good and talks about a lot of the things that will support uh, some of the street network details and design that I'll talk about with you. Uh, one thing I think that's important from a scale perspective, if you look at downtown Iowa City and put that same size of red square over this portion of the South District, um, it's a big area. You could fit a lot of downtown size areas in the South District. Not that we're proposing to fit a downtown, just for scale purposes. And then you've got uh, McCall McAllister, which a little bit more highlighted here. Talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, one of the things that I would like to see from a transportation perspective is McAllister being not just a through highway, but it being a thoroughfare that brings you to places throughout your neighborhood. It provides a through function between those two locations, but wherever, the, if whether they're these six locations or something else that adjust over time, these would be nodes. It could be a place, whether they're a place like the school or a place at a community park or perhaps a convenience store, bike shop, who knows, trailhead, a lot of different things. This um, diagram from the South Plan actually was drawn by a colleague of mine a number of years ago, and it talks about the differences between traditional neighborhood development and suburban sprawl, which from a land use perspective, you're all semi-familiar with it. But from a transportation perspective, it's a huge, huge, huge difference. It, here the diagram is reversed, and we look at, in the bottom is suburban sprawl, which could be shopping, a school, residential, different type of residential, and then McDonald's, Burger King, Jiffy Lube, you know, you name the the use, but the only way to connect these various uses is to get in your car and get out on the big road. In a traditional neighborhood, and even in parts of uh, downtown Iowa City, you've got more options of getting around. You can use your car to get from use to use, but even when you do use your car through the interconnected street network, you've got the option of driving, biking, or walking among these, ver these same uses over the same amount of land if you wanted to use that much land and not load up that regional roadway. That's what we're saying for McAllister. Let McAllister serve both a local function and also a more limited, um, more of a limited regional movement. One thing that ties into street network is uh, a T intersection. T intersections can be a very powerful design technique because it helps to build in traffic calming at the beginning of a project. You can't drive straight ahead. If you drive straight ahead here, you're going to run through that house. They would be very unhappy with you if you did that. So that actually happens to be a dead end, but it could, could be a T intersection. And in some parts of the world, like Australia, you're actually required to do T intersections as opposed to four-way stops. Because a four-way stop, if you're a bad driver, an inattentive driver, or an overly aggressive driver, you can just drive through the intersection without paying any attention to that stop sign. Harder to do with a T intersection construction. Now, speed is related to walkability, which is one of the standards in your South District plan to make sustainable, walkable neighborhoods. We want to make sure that if there is an interaction between motor vehicles and non-motorized people, that there's not a severe accident. And unfortunately, um, with very, what you'll see are low speeds, if you look at your speedometers driving around, up at only 36, 37 miles an hour, if you strike a pedestrian, you will probably kill that person. What the good news is, if you're going 20 miles an hour or less, that person's usually not permanently injured. Now, if, again, if you go back to your cars when you're driving around and look at the speed you're driving, you'll find that it's rare you'll be driving in that 20 mile an hour 
and below range because it's not comfortable. And you will drive what, it, what the street feels you're comfortable to drive. This happens to be Dodge, Tuesday night. Um, that is my hand with my stealthy radar detector. And that car was going 32 miles an hour. Now that's not lethal speed, but it's very damaging speed. If this concrete barrier hadn't been there and they had struck me, I wouldn't be talking to you tonight. So that's actually where Dodge comes in. I just happen to have this data for the Northside District, but I know that the same type of data would apply here. One of the things that you'll find in the north side that changes, uh, those streets are narrower than your streets. And at this time of day and on the weekends, you can park on both sides of those streets. So the street that during the day doesn't have parking on this side or this side, depending on whether the even or the odd day of the month, it is actually um, speeds well in excess of 20 miles an hour on these streets throughout the daytime. But in the evening and on the weekends, it's down below 20 miles an hour. And so in those neighborhoods, they're thinking about possibly having that on-street parking on both sides all the time as partly for traffic calming. You know, these, this is one of your older streets. Um, that is a very wide street. It doesn't have a lot of on-street parking, but even if you do, even down where you've got cars almost opposite each other, that's not going to slow anybody down much at all. So that's why you've got these guys. And to me, it's unfortunate to see a relatively new area that has already been installing what are, um, from an engineering perspective, a sledgehammer approach to something that really needs a finer touch. You know, it, it, it's a demonstration an admission, really, that there's something wrong with both this street and its network connectivity, that there, there's developed a need to install this um, speed hump. One of the things that causes that is what I'm about to explain here. This is a street in Maryland that I designed about 20 years ago. At the time, this was this is a 28-foot street. At that time, the narrowest street in that neighborhood was 36 feet. And the thinking was, well, you've got cars allowed to park on one side, cars allowed to park on the other side, cars going away from you, and cars coming toward you. So you have to think of that as 8, 8, 10, and 10, which is 36 feet. The problem is, with the off-street parking requirements, there wasn't a lot of on-street parking. So after a lot of arm wrestling, we got parking on one side, but we had to keep the 10-10 for the 28. The, what happens, however, is that in most neighborhoods, and this is actually much denser than a good bit of uh, your neighborhood, you don't have opposing vehicles most of the time on that street. So it's not 10 and 10, it's 20. And that truck is coming toward my hand, and it is going 38 miles an hour and accelerating as it heads toward me during the middle of the day. Not good driver behavior, didn't stage it. You know, this isn't some guy I paid to come out there and try to run me down and kill me. So um, you will see a series of these types of streets. I'm not going to get into all the details. This happens to be a yield street. If you see a Y in the title of it, that means it's a street where I want to design it so that if you do have opposing vehicles, one will have to wait and let the other one go by. If you don't have opposing vehicles, the vehicle by itself will go more slowly through the neighborhood. This is a, another example that's even narrower. This happens to be identical to a street I lived on for 10 years that has volumes far in excess of anything that I've seen posted for any of your streets in the South District. It's 21 feet wide, two-way, with one side parking. Very much a yield street. So street networks, um, you'll hear more about this in the ensuing discussions, but it's all, it should be all connected streets. This happens to show alleys as well, which I'm a proponent of alleys. I think a lot of the city planners are proponents of alleys. They let you do a lot of things that you can't do otherwise. One of the things from a street perspective, if you pr 
if you have alleys such as these narrower diagrams here, then you've taken all the driveways off the street. So all those backing and turning movements for cars coming off the street into driveways to get into garages, you've removed from that street, which is another reason why you can tighten that street up, make it narrower, and make it slower. So McAllister, there it is again. There's those nodes I talked about. And you know, one way to address in between nodes is to have two lanes with a center median, trees on, in the middle and on each side, and then a multimodal path on each side. I would rather see that than bicycle lanes in the street. Um, uh, that will be an arm wrestling contest between me and the Class A bicyclists, but I've had that discussion before. This supports all bicyclists. Bike lanes support some bicyclists. And then in the nodes, we could have on-street parking, the same street section, uh, depending on what you do with the trees, it could be much narrower than the city's standard of 100 feet. But, and this one happens to be 85. Um, but that would be something you would have in the node. It'd have some on-street parking because, again, that provides a traffic calming effect and it also gives you a place to park if you're at the node. And that's all I have. I will have to leave before everybody else, so if anybody has any questions, I'm here. If you don't have any questions, that's fine too. All right, thank you very much. This is Dan. Good evening. So I'm going to talk um, more specifically about missing middle housing types. And I know many of you came to uh, some of the previous uh, uh, workshops and presentations. But I think um, as a starting point, this is really about rethinking what a, neighbor, a new neighborhood looks and feels and lives, how it lives. Um, very, very different than what has recently been built in this area. This is about a walkable neighborhood. And why, why is this so important to talk about? Um, this isn't just about us as planners and urban designers and architects sort of trying to push a certain agenda about a walkable neighborhood. The National Association of Realtors does a study every year and their most recent study shows that every single market segment in terms of ages of markets from the millennials up to the baby boomers, um, almost 50% of every home buyer in the market wants to live in a walkable neighborhood. And that's growing. I'd say every year that percentage goes up. And what one of my friends said, what the millennials want, the baby boomers need in terms of walkability and access to amenities in their neighborhood without having to get into a car. And the other reason that this is important to talk about from a builder's perspective is um, attainability is what the, is the term that sort of a lot of the builders use. Cost of land is going up. Cost of entitlement is going up cost of construction, cost of labor, cost of materials. So it's really, really hard in any market across the country for builders to deliver housing, like the housing they've historically delivered, at price points that like an entry level market can afford in particular. So in addition, the builders are finding that that market that wants that walkable neighborhood living also want something different, something unique in terms of the housing types. They don't want the conventional single family detached house. They're looking for something different and there's a big gap between that 50% that want the walkable neighborhood living and we're only providing about 25% in any community across the country. So what do you get if you have a high demand and a low supply? Do you get affordable housing? No, you get expensive housing and so missing middle is an important piece of this and I think you've all seen this diagram but it's the duplex it's the fourplex it's the cottage court these are this is the missing middle it's basically house scale buildings that happen to have multiple units in them and I'm going to show you some examples here and we've we call them missing because you can find them in the neighborhoods built prior to the 1940s like if you go to Northside and the other neighborhoods adjacent to downtown, you can find these sprinkled throughout the neighborhoods. But for many reasons, starting with zoning, uh, market preferences in the 1950s, um, uh, we've we've basically almost built we've almost built none of these in the last 50 to 60 years. And so, right there's side by side duplex. 
This is a pretty straightforward type. Uh, this is actually a local example here, really nice um, housing type in a walkable neighborhood. We have a stacked duplex. So you go in one door here, go up a flight of stairs, you got a nice unit on the, on the top, and then you go on this bottom door and then they have the whole ground floor. Right, this is a house scale building that just happens to have multiple units. And what's really good about these missing middle types is you get enough people within a neighborhood area, a number of rooftops, population density, that you can actually support neighborhood commercial amenities. So that's, that's sort of where you, and you can actually support transit as well. If you, if, from a planner's perspective, it's 16 dwelling units per acre is what you need to support both transit and support those local sort of commercial areas. Um, a fourplex, right? There's very few of these in, in Iowa City. Well, most other cities have them, even places like Omaha, Kansas City. This is actually from Dallas, but uh, these, are, these are kind of, I call these the, like the Rosetta Stone of the missing middle because out of all the types, like nobody's building these right now for a number of different reasons, but uh, two units on the ground floor and two units on the top floor, right? But it looks like a house. If you were driving by this, would you ever guess that this wasn't a really nice single family home. And that's part of the point here. They live, they work and feel and behave like, much like a single family detached home. Um, and they provide a really nice housing choice um, in a walkable neighborhood. The cottage court, and this is usually everybody's favorite, um, you know, a series of small, usually small, historically they were small, 650 to 1,000 square foot, one story cottages, oriented around a shared, community green space, this space here. And a lot of times they're LA loaded, right? Whether they're the historic examples or newly built examples, it's just a lot easier. You get efficiency from a builder's perspective of having that parking right off the court. And these create a tremendous sense of community. Our, a friend of mine who develops these up in the Seattle area, um, her number one buyer, type of buyer, is a single, the single woman professional, sort of young professionals and older single women love the sense of community and the sense of security that comes in living in a missing middle community like this, All right? Just a really nice housing type. Um, and a lot of, we find that a lot of downsizing baby boomers sort of choose this type, sort of sell their suburban large house and move into a nice little uh, cottage court like this. Um, and what we did is we took a handful of these missing middle types, and we took, just to compare, a, four, a 80 foot wide by 150 foot deep lot, which is what typically the size of the lots that you have in the north side neighborhood, just to kind of give a sense of uh, grounding some of these types on a lot size that has existed historically. Um, and uh, what we looked at here is, right, According to your zoning, let's just say this, the, south, the South District isn't currently zoned because it's actually out, outside of the city, hasn't been annexed yet. But RS8 is one of the residential zones that actually has regulated some of the, the new housing around here. But this is what you could get a really large single family house in that RS8 district on that lot, right? And, um, you know, from an infill standpoint, we talked about this last night, that's actually a pretty big house. Um, and may not actually relate very well to its neighbors. But, you know, what are some of the other creative options um, that we can think about? So when we talk uh, about how do we plan and um, create a set of development standards for a, neighbor, a new neighborhood in the South District and sort of require and enable these missing middle housing types, and with the conventional way that a zoning is done is as a lot gets bigger, sort of the building can actually grow and get quite a bit bigger, and that's not the intent with the missing middle, right? Because a lot of, uh, uh, I'll call them conventional or suburban apartment buildings, you know, are bigger than the scale of a house, right? Um, but that we're trying to keep the buildings down to the scale of a house. And so on that same 80 foot wide by 150 foot lot, you can get two really nice sized, you know, medium sized single family detached houses with uh, an ex accessory unit above the garage in the back, right? That lot is actually pretty big, but what are some of the other examples? And so with the form-based approach to thinking about these types is we think about a house scale footprint and as a lot gets bigger, you don't sort of extrude that building and make that building bigger and make it out of scale with the neighborhood. You actually just add another 
maybe that's a fourplex and you add another fourplex right next to it. So it sort of retains the house scale nature of the missing middle housing types. And so, right, this is a cottage court and, and this isn't, these are drafts, these aren't architectural, this is really just intended for m scale uh, of the building and how it relates to the street and its neighbors. But if you take, you know, three of these small cottages and you could actually probably pretty easily fit a fourth on here and put it around a courtyard space, you get this really nice cottage court community on that size lot. Um, what we do a lot of times is in an area we, where the regulations might actually allow two stories and set a certain number of units, we might say, well, if you build the cottage court as a builder, we're gonna give you two more units on that lot, but they can only be one story and they can be no bigger than a thousand square feet. So it's incentivizing smaller units, which this, the market is really looking for. Um, and that cottage court in some instances could be two stories and still be a really charming little uh, option. This is a house scale building with three units in it, right? Two small units on the ground floor, a flight of stairs up with a, f a larger unit on the top, right? All fits on that same lot. And this is just showing, wanting to show you that a variety of these missing middle types can be compatible, can sit on the same street and sort of relate to one another in a really uh, good way. So this is a fourplex. That's the two units down and the two units up, just for sense of scale. And this is a larger sixplex. You know, this likely wouldn't be allowed everywhere, but it gets a little bit deeper on the lot, gets a little bit wider. Um, I think a type that we should be thinking about in the South District master plan area um, in specific areas. So. Once again, it's not just about the housing, it's about let's, let's think us outside of the box about what is a walkable neighborhood. And we've done this all across the country. Uh, most recently, we're doing it outside of Omaha, Nebraska, a really cool little missing middle neighborhood, but right, great open space, great sort of trail system. Um, this particular project actually has, when we talk about, we're really bad sometimes as planners, we talk about nodes and neighborhood centers. Um, what, we, what we really mean is this, is this is what you need in a walkable neighborhood at its center. You need a, a neighborhood main street that provides a certain amount of services, could be a small coffee shop, could be some professional uh, offices, maybe an architect or an attorney or even an artist could rent one of those spaces. It could be your dentist, it could be an optometrist, right? Within walking distance of your neighborhood. Um, so that's what we, when we talk about a neighborhood center, this is the type of place that we're envisioning. So just to give you a, a, a visual to tie to that. Um, so the, the approach is very different from conventional development in that the missing middle type, so all the beige colored types here are missing middle and all the white ones are single family homes. And so you can see here, like historically, and even in new neighborhoods, we can just sprinkle those missing middle types on the same block that have single family homes because they're compatible in scale. Um, and this is gonna tie back to the exercise that we're gonna have you do here too. Um, you might pick a street like McAllister and say, we're gonna put a really nice mix of missing middle types along that you know, middle stretch of McAllister. But as you turn the corner off of McAllister, you might transition to primarily small lot, single family homes in some areas, right? Just to, just to give you a sense of how you can mix the missing middle into a new neighborhood. The other way to do that is if we decide, you know, based on the South District plan that we wanna do a little neighborhood Main Street along McAllister where it meets Sycamore, you know, as you turn off of McAllister, you might pick a few of these, we might pick a few of these lots and say, hey, this is, this is where great lots for missing middle types are to transition from that neighborhood main street into a neighborhood that would, once again, be a, a large majority small lot single family homes. And so just to give you a sense of like, there's different ways, this, it's not about like creating a little section over in the corner of a neighborhood and like what we call potting, kind of create this isolated little group of housing. It's about integrating all these different housing choices and that's very different um, from the way that uh, housing has been delivered in the recent past. And it may also 
serve as a really nice transition. There may be actually some good opportunities to do some slightly larger, what we call upper missing middle, where it goes up to the third and the fourth story. And you turn around a corner, have the missing middle, and then you have single family detached. So just some ideas of ways we can integrate these types into a, a new neighborhood like the South District plan. So I'm gonna hand off to Courtney to talk about the exercise, uh, missing middle exercise we're gonna have you do tonight. How's everyone doing? Good? Great. So we're going to do a little activity that will help us kind of put into practice what Dan was talking about with regard to missing middle housing and picture, you know, what kinds of configurations that we could have. Um, so just kind of zoomed out big picture context of where we're looking at. Um, this is kind of the focus area that we're looking at for this exercise. So you'll see the maps here to my left. Um, for this area in orange, we've created sort of a, a basic street network and you can see the blocks highlighted in blue and then some civic spaces proposed in green. So we're gonna be looking at those and then sort of using some game pieces, in other words, footprints of lots with missing middle types on them and plugging those into the street network. So Dan's holding them up here and then in your, your handout, you also have an overview of these um, and I'm gonna walk you through just kind of a quick breakdown of um, of those. So you should see this page in your workbook that you got tonight. And I have some, we have some extra copies here if you didn't get one. Um, so this is sort of an overview of the types and a range from least intense to most intense, um, roughly. And then we have one that's kind of a, a little wild card on the end there. So as you see the colors get darker, that means, um, you know, there may be more units or it's a kind of a bigger type that might fit in differently in those different block configurations that Dan was just walking through. Um, so in that first sheet, you see these kind of smaller footprint, um, you know, lower unit count types might look a bit familiar from what you've seen around here. We included the single family house so that you can play with some block configurations and still integrate those single family houses. Um, and then there are two different types of duplex configurations, a side by side and then a stacked duplex. Um, the beloved cottage court that Dan mentioned and then the fourplex. And in the, on the next page, you'll see the more intense type. So just starting to think about, you know, what those bigger buildings could look like and, and how they could blend in and transition to a main street and going up to the more intense um, corridors. So your page will break down, you know, situations where these might be advantageous. So that'll be helpful as you're putting the game together and what types of situations and um, configurations you might use them for. So, but we'll be around just kind of um, to help you and think through if those might work well on a main street or on a civic space and how they could combine. Um, and here's just a, a reminder of the different uh, block assemblies that you might have. So just thinking creatively about, you know, what you have around here, since you can see on the map, I mean, the school's right there um, on that, that far edge. So well, the area that we've mapped out is right around here. So, you know, just thinking about what the existing context looks like and how we might be able to transition that. Uh, and then again, um, how they might lay out along McAllister there where it, it's becoming more of a, a main corridor. Um, just to run through those again, you can just see the different blending with single family homes placed on the end grain facing a, a corridor and facing the other way. Transitioning to a commercial corridor, so thinking again about McAllister. And then um, starting to think big on like the, the bigger, more intense types uh, from single family to higher intensity. So. Hopefully those are fresh on the mind now that you got to hear each of those twice. Um, so the approach that we're gonna take is, uh, we've got two maps set up here, but let's see how many we can get around one of them just to kind of get the discussion going. And um, we've got the game pieces here, but the idea is to focus on, you know, pick out a main street scenario, pick out a block facing the school, um, block facing a park or a civic space. Again, those green blocks that you see, just the different, you know, situations you might have and use that as your starting point to start putting your blocks together. So we're going to be taking these little footprints and um, we've made the lots the same depth. They're all 110 feet deep just to make it a bit easier. And they all make the assumption that these are alley loaded, um, parked. So you're going to have an alley running through and so you're going to be able to play with the different configurations whether that's a t or uh, if the alley goes all the way through you have a question um 
it's a good, great question. Um, so the question was in regards to the alleys and situations that we've worked on this in the past, under, under whose care or maintenance do those alleys fall? Uh, so there are a variety of ways of uh, maintaining the alleys. Um, they are always paved, <laughs> uh, and uh, different system, d depending on how the project gets developed. Sometimes it's a homeowners association that's maintaining them. Sometimes it's the city that's maintaining them. Uh, and we recognize that in the city of I uh, in Iowa City today, you have some alleys in some of your historic neighborhoods uh, that are just gravel. Um, and so the question then becomes, oftentimes what happens is uh, you'll either form a homeowner's association that will maintain new alleys, or um, there'll be almost a public improvement district that's made that says all the, all the development within this area, and it's usually you try and pick a large area, will help put money towards maintaining the alley. So the alleys will get built by the developer, but then over the long term, the city maintains them. Sure. So uh, just to repeat the question, the question was with regards to garages, if they're located uh, rear on the rear next to the alley or if they're located in the front. Um, what we often do in these situations is the alleys are located or, or the parking is accessed from the alley. Uh, and so sometimes the garage can be right up against the alley and sometimes you set them back a little bit from the alley. Um, and what that really helps is in terms of the walkability is you have fewer driveways crossing your sidewalks. You have fewer driveways crossing your multi-use trails. So, you know, and oftentimes when you back out of your garage, um, you're actually backing across the sidewalk. And so you don't have to worry as much about the conflicts of a, of a person walking along the sidewalk or a young child riding their bike along that sidewalk. Uh, and so we find that that really helps with the alleys uh, to have that way. Um, so maybe we can gather around this first map and we can talk, walk through a little bit of the exercise with the pieces and then we can actually break up. We set up another map if, if you all would like to break in half in terms of actually working out some ideas on different blocks. Mm -hmm.